title of today's message is let's get down look at your neighbor and say let's get down look at your other neighbor and say i hope you're ready to boogie <laughs> let's get down amen say that one more time say let's get down let's get down i want you to understand this morning that your everyone in here every one of us has problems every single person at the sound of my voice has problems those that are watching by internet those that are watching by tv every single person has problems and you know we look at other people's problems at, at lives and we say you know what they don't i wish i had their life i wish that it was as easy as as it looks to be but they've got problems too they might not have the problems you have but they and, and they you don't have the problems that they have it's the same thing but your problem i want you to understand this morning serves a purpose everybody say it serves a purpose, serves a purpose. if god allowed it to happen to you he's going to work it out for your good amen. amen now god gets blamed for an awful lot of things every time there's a calamity we call it what we call it an act of god I want you to understand there's a lot of religious people that believe that every negative thing, if somebody gets sick or gets cancer, that God put it on them. And then, then they try to explain healings by believing and saying that the devil heals. I want you to understand that's not true. John 10.10 10 says that the thief, the devil, comes to do what? To kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life and that more abundantly. You see, God looks at things totally different than we do. Amen. God looks at things totally different than we do. Even death is the most dreaded thing that human beings can face. I mean, right? We, we just hate it. We despise it. We don't like the idea of it. But God, the Bible says, how it sees it as something precious. Precious in the sight of God is the death of His saints because we're going home. Amen. Amen. We're going home. Amen. Praise the Lord. And our lives are so small here in, in, in comparison to eternity. Let me give you an example. Years ago, there was a story of this young girl that was dying. She was maybe less than seven years old, maybe even younger than that. But she had a disease, and she was in a children's hospital, and she was dying. How many of you know that God appears in the form of men many times through angels? God, angels appear in the form of, of people, men and women. Well, one time, there was a, uh, this man, this father was very bitter of this young girl, and he was very mad, very angry at God. Very angry that he was going to lose his daughter, and he was not saved, and he was bitter, and his, his, his life was just full of anger, especially over this. this just set, he was an angry, bitter person to begin with, but this set him over the top. This was the final straw. He was done. We had an encounter with this uh, person that was in his daughter's room, and this person, this lady, was a janitor. She was not a nurse, not a doctor, but she, he thought she was just there to clean up. And he was just coming in angry, and, and the, the woman encouraged him, encouraged him, and said, it's you we're worried about. He goes, what do you mean it's me you're worried about? My daughter's dying. I'm fine. Oh, no, no, your daughter's going to be fine. Your daughter's going to be just fine. What if it? She's dying. You're worried about, it's you we're worried about. It's you we're concerned about. And make a long story short, that was an angel, and the man's life was changed. No, that wasn't from the movie Touched by an Angel. It was a true story. This man testifies about it today. God spoke through that man, through that woman, to that man, and his life changed, and he got saved because they were, God was concerned more about him than the dying girl because he knew within a matter of moments the dying girl was going to be in his bosom in eternity waiting for everybody who loved her. But that man, if he had died in that condition without Christ, with a bitter, angry, hurtful soul, he would have been in hell. See, God looks at eternity so different than we look at eternity. So we've all got problems. And I want you to understand this morning that if God allows it to happen in your life, He is going to work it out for your good. But in order to allow God to work it out for our good, we've got to get down. Can I get an amen? amen. We've got to go down in order to go up. That's how amen. the kingdom of God operates. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1-10, through 10, we have the story of a man by the name of Naaman. Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Syria. And he was a great man, everybody say great man. Great man. With his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Notice what it says there. The Lord had given victory to Syria. Mm. Over who? Over the nation of Israel. That's an interesting statement. I want you to remember that. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. A leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl. Everybody say little girl. Little girl. Say Naaman was, great, Naaman was great. But this girl was little. 
from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. Verse 3. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So she says to, to this, the, the wife of Naaman, if, our Lord, if my Lord, if Naaman would go down to this prophet in Israel, God would cure him of, of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. <clears throat> so he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten, uh, ten changes of clothing. Notice what he did. He took a lot of money, he took a lot of gifts, and he was going to go down to Israel to receive his healing. Verse 6. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Verse 7. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? Only to consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Verse 8. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, we have, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with the horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Everybody say clean. Clean. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to understand the background of this story. Here you, we have two people. Number one, we have Naaman. We'll start with him. Naaman was a, a hero in Syria. Now, Syria was, the, was an enemy of the nation of Israel, God's people. And the nation of Israel had once again turned their backs on God and gone into idol worship. So the hand of God's protection had been lifted from them. And they were under discipline and correction because who the Lord loves, He chastens. Even if he has to use your enemies to do it. So Syria came in and they uh, spoiled Israel. They defeated them. They annihilated their country. And now they were reigning supreme over Israel. Now Naaman was a tremendous general. He was a hero of his nation at the time. He was very, he had the prestige and the honor of, let's say, General Schwarzkopf after the Desert Storm. He had the prestige and honor of General Patton, General uh, MacArthur, and, uh, you know, Eisenhower after World War II. He was a national hero. He was looked up to. Everybody honored him. Everybody respected him. Little boys played and, and played war, and they wanted to be like him when they grew up. That's who this Naaman character was. He was a great, the Bible says, and he was a mighty man. Now, mind you, the Bible says that God is the one who gave him the victory even over his own people. But I guarantee you that he didn't see it that way. Naaman was powerful and he paid his dues. Contrast that to the fact that now he had leprosy. Leprosy back in those days was a disease that was contagious. If you had leprosy, it meant that you were quarantined on the outskirts of the camp. You were in your own little colony because your hands would fall off. Your, your, your toes would fall off. Your feet, your ankles, whatever. Your bones would fall off. You would rot. You stunk. It was a disease that was, everybody dreaded. And if you were a leper, you'd lost your place in society and you were an outcast. You were put on the outskirts of town. Everybody would rather have died instantly than to be a leper. So here was Le uh, Naaman. Now Naaman had, in the spoils of war, had stolen a little Israel, a Israelite girl. Now she was not a little girl, meaning like she was a juvenile, but the Bible says that she was little. How many of you know that when God puts something in the Bible, puts something in His Word, He does it on purpose? When He said Naaman was great, He meant that Naaman was mighty. He had a lot of prestige. But this girl, this young lady, was little. That means that she was not a, a head servant. She was not a mid-level management servant. She was the lowest of all servants. So in this house, you have two people. Number one, you have Naaman, who was great because of what he did. But we're going to discover in the context of the story that this little maid was great because of who she knew. Now, I want you to understand this morning that who you know will always trump what you do. That's right. Who you know will always trump what you do. Now, I want you to understand this morning that the real test of who you are is what you do with power. 
That's right. The real test of what you, who you are will always trump, will always be determined by what you do with power. That's PowerPoint number three, please. The real, let me say that again. The real test of who you are is what you will do with power. Mm -hmm. yes. Does it go to your head? Does it change you? Do you use it to your advantage or do you use it to make other people's lives better? You see, weakness is not a determination of who you are. Because in weakness, in weakness, we have no options. But when you have power, you have you hold the cards. You have all the options in the world. And see, the answer to Naaman's problem, this great powerful man, was in his own house. And she was held captive by divine purpose. This young girl, this servant girl, was there on divine assignment. And her problem served a purpose. Just like your problems right now, if you will allow God to let them serve a purpose. You're not in the situation you're in by accident. God understands what you're going through. God is going to deliver you through it. There is a guarantee in His Word in regards to that. But in the meantime, we've got to understand that your problem, your dilemma, your situation, where you're at, serves a purpose. I want you to remember Samson. Long before Samson ever took the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand fish. Philistines. Some, but that donkey had to die. You can't get a, do a jawbone off of a donkey very easily unless it's dead. That donkey had to die. Long before Zacchaeus ever at climbed that tree so he could see Jesus, somebody had to plant that tree. I'm here to tell you that the provision to your problem has already been established. The ram has already been sacrificed. I'm here to tell you that the blood has already been shed. The way has already been made. The mountain has already been moved. I'm here to tell you, hallelujah, that God is in your tomorrow as surely as you are in your today and as surely as you have been in your yesterday. If you believe that this morning, come on and put your hands together and praise the risen King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, here we have the contrast between two individuals. And they were both captive. We have one who was captive because of a disease that he had no control over. Josephus, the great uh, interpreter of the scriptures from long ago, records and writes that this Naaman had received this leprosy because he dared to attack God's people. But not only that, but because he took this little Israelite girl as God's slave. That may be. I don't know. The scripture doesn't say that. It's a good commentary. I, I would say there's probably a lot of truth in that. Why? Because the word of the Lord says, uh, God said uh, to, to Abraham, I will multiply thee, I will bless you and make you great upon the earth, and I will make a nation out of you, and all those who bless you, Abraham will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. Amen? And you might say, well, what does that have to do with me, preacher? Well, the Bible says that we have, if we are in Christ, we are new creatures. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If we are in Jesus Christ, that means the Bible says, according to Galatians 3, we've been grafted in. We are now Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yes. So if people bless us, they'll be blessed. If people curse us, they'll be cursed. Amen? Amen. Amen. God has an obligation to protect His children. Now we're in a season of grace, so there's a whole lot less of it now than ever before because we are in a season of grace. But in this time, there wasn't a lot of grace established. Amen? So this man was sick with leprosy. Now we always say this. We always say, God, order my steps. We know that God, the Word says that the, our, the steps of a righteous person are set up. They're ordered from the Lord. But we want, to, we want to sing that song and we want to believe that and we want to herald that when, our, when they are good steps, when God's leading us into the good places, when we're in the mountaintops, when we're in the high places, when everything's going well, we're excited that God is ordering our steps. But what about when we're going down? What about when our steps are taking us somewhere? When life's taking us somewhere we really don't want to go? Is He your God in the mountaintop is the yes. same as He is your God in the valley? Yes. Is He your God when you're in victory? The same as He's your God when you're in defeat? Uh, we, want, we love the fact that God's love for us is unconditional and He loves us no matter what and He's faithful no matter what to us. But what about when, when it doesn't feel like He's being faithful to us? What about when we're in the valley of the shadow of death? What about when we're struggling? What about 
about when we're hurting? What about when it looks like lack is all around us? Listen, I want you to understand if God, if he's the same God who orders our steps on the mountaintop, he's the same God who orders our steps in the valley low. He's the same God, hallelujah. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. He's the God of everything in between. If you believe that this morning, say amen. Amen. Yes. Is he just your God in the good times? Naaman and the woman were in a similar position, weren't they? That's right. They were both in a place they couldn't get out of. Naaman had a disease that he didn't bring upon himself, and he had a disease that he could not cure. And this woman was held captive by this man. Her nation had been obliterated. Her family had been separated. And both were held captive. And this little woman had a choice. She knew of a prophet. She knew of a healing God. A real God. See, Syria had their gods too, but they were false idols. They were statues. But this woman, she was an Israelite. And she knew of a man that could heal him through God. And here's what she could have done. What would you have done? What would you have done in that situation? Ask yourself that. Number one, Everything that she loved, every time she looked at this name, she was reminded of everything she loved had been obliterated. The nation she loved, the country she loved, had been torn apart. Her family had been separated. She had lost her freedom. And she was living in the house of the man who was primarily responsible for it. And now all of a sudden he comes down with leprosy. His flesh is starting to rot. It's starting to be inflamed. I mean, most people would have probably said, no matter how spiritual we are, we probably would have said, good. He deserves it. I hope I'm there when he finally gets cast out of this house and loses his position and ends up out into the colony of lepers. Because this is what he deserves! I'm here to tell you this morning that Naaman is fortunate. Naaman was lucky. He was blessed. That a God-fearing, godly woman full of mercy lived in his house versus some bitter old crank. Amen? Amen. Amen. He was fortunate. Here's the, here's, what she, here's the thing. She could have held back. When we hold back on what we could do, hear me, when we hold back on what we could do, God holds back on what He can do. Because God is a God of mercy. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. I, we're supposed to be a people that go the extra mile. We're supposed to be a people that love those who spite us, love our enemies. And when we hold back on what we could do, God holds back on what He can do. And until we learn to be merciful, we'll never be mighty. Amen. And your greatest test, hear me out, church, your greatest test might be how you handle the person that you hate. Mm. Because it's easy to love those who love you. Amen. It's easy to care for those who care for you. But it's hard to go the extra mile and love those who don't. And bless those who are not blessing you. Amen? But she did it. And she said, there is a prophet. There is a prophet, Naaman, in Israel who can bless you. Who can heal you. And he will set you free. Now here's what Naaman did. Naaman said, I, I'm willing to do it. But in Israel... Those people don't like me much. We just gave them a bloody nose. So here's what he did. He writes a letter to his king. And it, it takes it to his king. And his king says, I don't know what to tell you, Naaman. I'm paraphrasing. I read all this to you. So he takes that letter and he sends it off. He sends it off to the king of Israel. Now let me explain something about these two countries. You had Israel which is where the little slave girl was from. And then you had Syria, which is where Naaman was from. Syria had just whooped Israel. And they had what was known as a ceasefire. That was a truce. It was not a peace treaty. It was not. But they just kind of decided to stop the fight for a while. They came to a truce. And they kind of did not like each other. Very similar to what's happened on the Korean Peninsula about 60 years ago. 
From what I understand, there was never a peace agreement there. It was a truce and a ceasefire. And I think recently they've done something that with, with peace in regards to it between the two countries. But for years, there was no peace. It was just kind of like, you stay over there and I'll stay over here. Like a good neighbor, stay over there. You know, all of them And that's what they did. They just kind of stayed away from each other. Right? So there was tension there. And at any moment, it could erupt again. And you better believe that Israel was raising their army up, figuring out what they did wrong, figuring out, instead of getting with, right with God and on their face before God, to go down, to get down with God so they could rise up again. They didn't do that. They didn't think about that. They were probably just rebuilding their army and pridefully saying, we will get them back. We will get them back. Yeah, God would help you and make it a lot easier and quicker if you would go that route, but you won't. So anyways, what they did is they, they, they were angry with each other. There was tension there. So now Naaman has his king send a letter to the king of Israel. And you saw the reaction of the king of Israel. He tore his clothes. He got so mad. He said, the nerve of this guy came in here and did all this to us. And now who does he think I am? Who does he think that I am that I can heal him? Am I God? You see, here's Naaman's mistake. And this is the mistake a lot of us make in our lives. Naaman is trying to seek healing amongst princes and kings. And God is going to do it through preachers and a maid. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, it wasn't an attack on Sa of Satan, but this was a sovereign move of God in Naaman's life to bring him to his destiny. Had Naaman not been afflicted, had he not been afflicted, had he not gotten leprosy, he would have never found the God of Israel. Right? Amen. Because the door to your deliverance, the door to your healing, the door to your victory, the door to your promotion, the door to your next level is always through the door of humility. That's the only way. And God exemplified this to us in scriptures. We see it in his example. When Jesus ministered to the woman that was caught in adultery, what did he do? The Bible says that he went and he, he saw her on the ground and he, he, he did what? He stooped down. He stooped down and he began to write the sin of all the men that were ready to stone her to death, their names and the sin next to it. He stooped down. He humbled himself. The night of the Last Supper, when Jesus was trying to set the example that he was going to the cross, the Bible says that he took off his ephod, he took off his, not his ephod, but his mantle, and he put a towel around his waist, and he stooped down, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. The way to up is always down. When the disciples were arguing and fussing and fighting over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, he said, if you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, it's he who serves the most people. See, the world system is different. The world system is always trying to get a step up. The world system is always looking for prestige. The world system is always wanting to take credit. I did it. I did it. That's why God sent an evangelist to us, a revival and awakening to Green County. I went weeks without even knowing the guy's name. <laughs> and it didn't matter. You look on Facebook, you try to find anything about his name, you, you can find it, but you've got to really dig deep with a search warrant. It's all about the Greenville awakening. God used a man who had been saved for two years, brought him out of the liquor cabinet, brought his wife out of the exotic dance club read her book amen, amen. Um, no name nobody individual praise the lord probably without even by day one of bible training but god speaks through him and uses him why because the way of the of the world is exaltation is pride is arrogance but the way of god is always humbleness and humility you've got to go down you've got to get yeah. down to get back up yeah amen, amen. give the lord some praise Give the Lord some praise. So, hallelujah. It, it's a door of humility. And Jesus, hear me, church. Jesus is God in his fullness, stooping down to humanity. Because the Bible says that Jesus, the Prince of Glory, was not born in a palace. He did not come in beautiful robes. He did not come with scepters. He'll come back that way. He did not come in glory, but the Bible says that he humbled himself. He stripped himself. 
He let, laid his glory down. He laid his position down. He laid his title down. And he was born amongst the poorest of the poor and lived as the poorest of the poor because the way to going up is always going down in the kingdom of God. Can I give an amen? amen. Can I give an amen? It's always going up. You must go down. Hallelujah. And Naaman was used to giving orders and not taking orders. Naaman had probably never been in this position since he was a corporal in the army. Never been in this position, ever. And he probably skipped all those steps because he probably had a ticket to the top because he was so gifted and so special. Amen? He probably went to their military academies and skipped all those lower ranks. Amen? Now here's the thing. So now, here's what he has to do. He has to go to the prophet of God in order to get his healing. Ha! Huh. And he goes down to the house of Elisha because he tries his level. He tries to do it his way. He tries to rely on his education. He tries to rely on his resume. He tries to rely on his wisdom. He tries to rely on his people. And God says, they said, we're not God. We don't have a thing to do with it. How desperate that moment must have been when you've realized that everything you built, God wasn't in it. How desperate that moment must have been. When everything you've relied on, all of your life, when your life came crashing down, the only thing, the only one that could heal you, deliver you, give you peace, pacify you, carry you through it, was God Himself. Yes, amen. And you went to man, but man said, I'm not God. You went to mama and daddy and they said, we love you, but only God can help you. This is where Naaman was. Naaman had to be scratching his head. He had to be confused. Because all of his training, all of his resume, everything he was, everything he knew was going to fail him now. None of it could help him. The only thing that could help, one that could help him was some jack leg preacher, a little country preacher out in the middle of nowhere by the name of Elisha. Right. So here's this man who is now high and lifted up and has to go out in the country. And, and I'm not saying that derogatory about Elisha. He and Elijah were country preachers, man. In fact, when Elijah, his predecessor, Elisha, came before King uh, Ahab and Jezebel, she, they said, who is this hick? I mean, who is this country bumpkin, so to speak? I'm not, that's, what, that's what he was. And God used him. And then he went on and God turned it over to Elisha. And when he found Elisha, Elisha was plowing a field. These were simple, common people that God raised up. And so here comes Naaman. And he comes into Israel. And he comes in with his entourage. Today it would have been all the black SUVs. With the sirens and the, 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 the four-way lights flashing. We're here. We're big. We're popular. We're important. We're important. We're important. Look at us. And all the guys that got, got out with their suits and their guns in it. The entourage would have come and they would have scoped out the area with their R R car car. R R car car. All clear. All clear. And they knock on the prophet's door. And the prophet said, Oh, Naaman's here. Naaman's here. Oh, I heard about this Naaman. I want to get his autograph. And the prophet goes high-stepping down there and opens the door and says, Oh, Naaman, what an honor that you're here in my church. Let me give you the best seat in the house. Is that what happened? Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that Elisha said, sent his servant. I'm busy. You deal with him. So the servant goes, knocks on the door. And there's Naaman. Are you Elisha? No. Sorry to disappoint you, but he ain't much better. Can I help me? Can I help me? Uh, do you know who I am? Oh, uh, yeah, you're that naming guy, right? Yeah. You're the guy with the leprosy. Well, that's not how I wanted to be addressed. Well, it, it is you, right? You have leprosy, don't you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now I'm a leper. I used to be great. I used to be a general. I used to be all of that. No, leper. People used to throng to me. People used to adore me. 
People used to want to lift me up and get my autograph. They wanted their children to be by, by, like me. Now nobody wants to be around me because I might touch them and give them leprosy. And here I am out in the middle of Israel, in the country. And I can't even get the prophet to come to the door. He sends his servant. Let's look at the levels Naaman had to go down. He had to go down. You want me to stop doing that, don't you? <laughs> Man, I was so good when I used to be in college and I'd go into clubs and I'd go out there on the dance floor. Man, I was so good, everybody just scattered, you know. They just gave me the yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's why they were scattering, but they said, look, get away from this freak. <laughs> this geek over here, you know. So, but listen, let's look at the levels he had to go down. The first thing he had to do is he had to go down to the servant girl because he heard that she knew of a prophet. So he had to come down to the servant girl. Then the next thing he had to do is he had to go down to his own king and say, I need you to do something for me. So then the king says, I can't. You've got to go into Israel. I can't make them. So then he has to go down another rung to the king of Israel. Then he goes down into Israel itself where everybody that lived in that land despised him, hated him. He had to go down. He had to go down. Why is it that when a, a man or a woman finally come to a place of sobriety or they come to a place with Christ ideally and hopefully or even in AA, the first thing they do is you have to admit you're powerless and then one of the steps is to go and, 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 and repent, so to speak, and make amends to all the people that you have hurt because the way to go up is to go down first. So he has to go to Israel. Then he has to go down to the prophet and then he has to go down. The prophet wouldn't deal with him. So now he's got to go down to the servant. And the servant tells him to go down even further. To the muddy water. <laughs> and here's, where he's, here, here, here's the thing. If you're willing to go down low enough, God will heal those issues in your life. Amen. Yeah. I'll say it again. If you're willing to go down low enough, God will heal those issues in your life. Humility is always the way to exaltation. Amen. God said in His own word that I will bless those who bless you, but He also said that I will exalt the humble and I will humble the exalted. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, that's what He said in His word. And the quickest way to go up is to go down. Whatever goes down will go up. Now the world system says what goes up must come down. But God's kingdom is an inverted kingdom. God's kingdom says if you want to be great, you must make yourself small. If you want to be mighty, if you want to go up, you must go down. If you want to be blessed, you've got to give. Everything's backwards in God's kingdom. Amen. Whatever goes down has got to come up. Unless a seed goes down into the ground, it cannot come up as a tree in a harvest. What's God trying to wash out of this man, Naaman? What's he trying to do? I mean, this guy is full of something. And God's trying to wash something out of Naaman. You know what it was? It was leprosy. And the leprosy was symbolic on the outside of the leprosy of this man's pride, arrogance, and haughtiness on the inside of who he was. Huh. And when they told him to go dip into the Jordan, that muddy river, you know what he said? Oh, sure, I'll get right on that. He says, no. He says, enough is enough. I'm just about done. He says, enough is enough. I'm not going to do it. I'm going home. But thank God that the Lord spoke through one little servant because another one of his servants said this in 2 Kings 5, verse 13. He said, but his servant came near and said to him, my father it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? He has actually said to you, wash and be clean. But before that, I'm paraphrasing it, read your Bible for yourself. Before that, the servant says to him and reminds him, look, you brought all of these gifts, you brought all of this money, you brought all of this, these things, and if, this, if the prophet had said to you, Give this money to the king. Give this money to the house of worship. Give this money to me. Surely you would have paid it in a heartbeat. 
So you don't, you can get out of here with all your money. You can get out of here with all your clothes. You can get out of here with everything that you came with. All you got to do is go down there and dip in that water seven times. Come on, you're a big tough man. Go down there and do it. We'll get you a bath later. What's wrong with you? I'll tell you what was wrong with him. It was the humility of going down. Yes, amen. Huh. Yes. It was the humility of going down. Praise the Lord. One of the enemies of God is haughtiness. His arrogance, his pride. The Bible says that he in, will in no way cast out a broken and a contrite heart. You want to know when God's preparing and training and working on, his, on, his, on one of his servants? They'll go through seasons and seasons of humiliation. They'll go through seasons because he's got to work something out of them. Amen. You see, your pride, I don't know who I'm speaking to. Maybe I'm speaking to the camera. Your pride is standing in the way of your destiny. You're more worried about your image than you are your deliverance. Mm. The Syrians didn't believe in God. Mm -mm. They worshipped their false gods. And Naaman goes down and he says, enough, I'll do it. And God, and the prophet didn't tell him to dip once. Mm -mm. He didn't tell him to dip twice. He didn't tell him to dip three times. He didn't tell him to do it one for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He didn't tell him to dip four times. He didn't tell him to dip five times, with the number five represents grace. He didn't tell him to dip six times, because then he could have said, I did it. I dipped six times, because the number six represents flesh. It represents man in the Scriptures. God's number of seven is always completion. He was told to dip seven times. He went down once. He went down twice. He went down three times. He went down four times. He went down five times. And he comes up and he's still sick. He's still afflicted. The leprosy was still there. He went down six times. And finally he went down seven times. And when he came up on the seventh time, your Bible records that his skin was as new as a little Yes, to those who pray. And God set all this up. They blamed the devil, but God set all of this up. Why? Two things happened here. Israel was repenting about this time. They being taken over by another nation of people, their eyes were opened, and they were beginning to see that we need to repent and turn back to God. But Syria had no, no God. They had no understanding. They didn't believe in God. God used somebody that Syria respected and Syria honored and raised him up in order to be a witness. Naaman said this after all this took place and after all this happened. Naaman said, I now have got to serve the God of Israel. Read the book. And he said this. He said, he went to the prophet. And he says, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to bless you. And the prophet said, no, don't give it to me. The prophet said, if you want to do anything, make an offering unto the Lord. That's how you do it. So he made an offering unto the Lord. It changed his life. He was now a worshiper of Jehovah God. I'm here to tell you this, that people you know would never come to your church. They would never come to your God had it not been by one watching you through the moments and the times and the seasons of affliction in your life and how you handled it. Because how you handled it showed them and reinforced to them that there's something true to this God that is sustaining you. There's got to be something because you ought to be angry. You ought to be ready to quit. You ought to be ready to throw in the towel. You ought to be losing your ever-loving mind. But you're still standing. You're still praising. There's still a smile on your face. You're still being kind when everybody's being wicked to you. Why? What is it? There can only be one explanation. Some kind of a supernatural thing working on the inside of you. I gotta have what you have. What church do you go to? Naaman said, who is this God that healed me? And what a man. What a man to be a testimony. Because he had the ear of the entire nation. Yeah. In Acts chapter 11, revival took, out an, uh, took off in Antioch. And Philip the evangelist sparked that revival. God used him in a mighty way to spark that revival. I mean, put yourself in Philip's shoes, amen? People are getting saved and delivered, and man, a church is being formed there in Antioch. But God says, Philip, Philip, 
Woo! Buddy, get your eyes off that. You're not a pastor. You're an evangelist. I got some pastors coming to solidify that and disciple those people. I got to work for you. You're an evangelist. Come on. Takes him out of there, translate towards him over to one eunuch. One eunuch. Leads that eunuch to Jesus Christ. That eunuch was a servant of the queen of Ethiopia. The, ser the eunuch tells the queen of Ethiopia about Jesus. She gets saved and revival sparked through the entire Ethiopian nation. Now to Philip, that had to be a drag, man. God, this is how you reward me for leaving that great revival where everybody was praising you through because of the work and the ministry of what I've done. Oh God, you, 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 why did I, you know, why did I have to leave that? Why did I have to leave that? Listen, God has a bigger picture many times in our lives. Huh. Praise the Lord. People you know would never come to your church, would never come to your God, had it not been through what you've been through. And when you prayed and you asked God years ago, God, use me. He was listening. We thought it was going to be, you know, tip throw toe through the tulips all the time. Mountaintop experiences all the time. Maybe he'd use me to sing on the praise team here and there. Maybe he'd use me to receive an offering in church or, or cut the grass, you know. And God says, that's all good. And that's all fine and dandy. But you asked me to use you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. Let me say this again as I close. Your problem serves a purpose. God's saying to some people today, might be listening, watching TV. Maybe you're here. If you'll just trust me, if you will trust me in the midst of all of this, I will bring a deliverance into your life. I'm working some things out. I'm working some things in. If you'll just trust me through this dark season, through this dark time, you're going to understand when you look back why you had to go through this. Mary Magdalene, the two Marys, <clears throat> when they asked Jesus to come because their brother was sick, dying, four days later he gets there. They didn't understand. And they even confronted him. They said, Lord, what took you so long? You could have healed my brother and he wouldn't be dead. And he said, Lazarus will live again. Oh, I know he'll live again. I know he'll live again in the last days. I know it. He said, no, you don't. In the time of the resurrection. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Say that with me this morning. Say, I am, I am. the resurrection and the life. Now Lazarus come forth and he was resurrected right there. And a great number of people. Here's what happened in that situation. Mary and Martha quit bickering. And guess what? All the people that were laughing Jesus to shame when they said he's only sleeping. I'm going to raise him. They weren't laughing no more. Now they were believers. I want you to understand this morning that you're going to have to appear weak sometimes to win. You're going to have to dip in order to come up. You're going to have to humble yourself if God's going to bring you through the door to your victory, the door to your deliverance, the door to your to everything that God has for you is always 100% of the time a door of humility. When I am weak, he is strong. When I am poor, hallelujah. When, when, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done in me. I'm here to tell you that victory is on the way. Victory is promised. Your deliverance is promised. Hallelujah. Everything you're believing for is going to come to pass. You've got to believe it. God has a purpose. It's not going to be forever, although it feels like forever. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, and I know, I'm surprised Marty didn't remind me last week, but I had Daniel in that fiery furnace last week. No, Daniel was in the lion's den. I apologize for that one. Amen? But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, and while they were in there just for a few minutes, it must have felt like an eternity because it was so hot. But the good news of the hour is this. God brought him out. He was the fourth man in that fiery furnace. In the, abyss, in the midst of your battles, in the midst of your affliction, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of where you are at, God, Jesus Christ, is right there with you. Hallelujah. And he's saying, Naaman, 
and name it, if you will humble yourself, if you will trust me, if you will go down. But God, I've already gone down. How much lower can I get? God says you've got to go lower because you're still alive. What about dignity? To hell with dignity. What about my pride? To hell with my pride. Yes. What about me, God? The fact that you're saying, what about me, God, is the fact that you're still alive. The Bible says that when Jesus went to the cross, they reviled him, but he reviled them not back. Amen? The Bible says that he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He never spit upon them. He never cursed upon them. He was what? He was love incarnate. He was victory incarnate. He was the resurrection. He was the life. He rose from the dead. And we all benefit from it today. If you believe that this morning, come on and put your hands together and magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet with me today?